Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. As you know, like, my name is Ruben Lozano. I'm a product manager now. I'm actually a new product manager at Google Maps, focusing on driving and personalization. But before that, I was a PM at Google Cloud, uh, Amazon Search, and I had a couple of years of experience at Microsoft at Samsung. Uh, so today, I want to talk to you about using the scientific method of uh, the, the scientific method to conduct experimentation as product managers. Um, based on my experience, when people talk about conducting experiments in the tech industry, they are talking about A-B testing. And for the few of you who are not very familiar with that concept, at its most basic, it's just comparing two versions of something to figure out which one of the two performs better. There are multiple other types of experimentation, more advanced, like multivariate testing or multi-arm bandit, but I'm not going to be covering those during this talk. Nonetheless, I want to talk to you about that, the fact that experimentation is just one of multiple methodologies that you have in your product management toolkit to conduct user research. And as such, I want to just to talk to you a little bit about how about user research and where experimentation fits into, into user research. So what is user research? It's a systematic approach to discovering user needs, pain points, aspirations, you name it. And as product managers, we can use user research to really ground, verify, and validate the products that we are building. And it's important uh, to understand which methodology is the best to use for. Uh, so where does it fit in the product development cycle? User research fits everywhere, from the start to the, uh, to the end, and, and there are different methodologies for each step. For example, there are foundational research uh, that will help you as a product manager to really uh, build empathy towards people. And I'm using the word people because at that moment, that's what you want. This is where you conduct ethnographic studies or diary studies. And after you build that empathy, then is when you start uncovering those needs. And that, that information can help you drive the strategy or the direction of your product. At other parts of your development cycle, you have some other methodologies. For example, in, in the ones from iterative research, you may say, hey, I already know the problem that I want to approach, but I want to get some user input to understand which path to follow. In those cases, you may want to do some uh, usability testing or user testing. And experimentation actually just fits in the last one, in evaluative research. That means that you use those kind of methodologies when your product is done or almost done and you're looking to improve it. User research and experimentation gives you very rich data, but it's important to understand what type of data experimentation is giving you. And you can, you can understand that or you can, yeah, you, can, you can get more inputs based on what dimension uh, you're talking about. So experimentation is going to give you behavioral data. It means that it will tell you what other people are doing. But it's not, it's not going to give you attitudinal data, like what people like or what they want or what they may want in the future. Uh, experimentation will give you quantitative data. So experimentation will help you answer questions like how much, how many, but it won't help you to understand why something happens. And experimentation is done in a context where it will give you data that is real or on an almost natural environment. So you actually need to have the product almost in the wild to be able to, to use this kind of uh, methodology. So now with that background, I want, to, I want to talk about like, okay, so what is an experiment? So an experiment is a way to test a hypothesis about your product. And in other companies like Google or Amazon, Experimentation is also a synonym to say, to talk about the gradual launch of a, of a product, of a feature. But for this talk, I'm only going to talk about the first one, that is um, the live experiments. Something else that I want to talk is that tests are not experiments. They are a very important part of the software development process, but it's not an exper they are not experiments because you, you know in advance the outcome of, 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 the, of the feature. So why run live experiments? I was talking to you that to be able to run an experiment, you have to have the product done. Likely you had to do a lot of user research, you had to do usability testing. So you already invested a lot of time and resources for that. And come on, I mean, you're a product manager, that's your objective to know what you're going to be building. 
Um, and you're a PM, right? You're supposed to be smart. You're supposed to know what happens or why to, why to spend time doing this. Let me tell you that humans are terrible, terrible at making predictions. Um, I, I know, I know, I might too soon possible, right? Uh, <laughs> but something interesting here is that our mind trick us. Sometimes we actually believe that we're really good at making predictions. And I'm sure that you or maybe someone that you know, they will, think, they will say today that they knew deeply what was going to happen in 2016. But actually, they didn't. And then we start having an, a perception of ourselves as that we're much better than others. Um, and it's not true. Like, we're, we're pretty bad at making predictions, and that's something that experimentation can help you with. Another, another, uh, some other people will say, well, you already invested so much time on this. Why don't you just launch it and see what happens? Um, that's, that's true. That's valid. Um, I want to show you an example of go at Google. So uh, roughly, these are search queries uh, over time. And as you can see, there's a big drop. On, on searches uh, exactly at that moment. And at that moment, uh, the product team actually released a new feature. But they were not worried. I will give you a hint. This happened in Brazil in June 2014. Any ideas? Exactly, the World Cup, right? People were actually watching the World Cup. They were not searching at Google. So that's why uh, the, the number of searches went down. But because the team was using an, an A-B experiment to launch their feature, they were not worried. And they were able to understand that it was not their feature what caused the impact. With a pre and post, you won't be able to know that. And that's the beauty of A-B experimentation. It helps you isolate just the impact of your product changes. And you can use them for so many different uh, possibilities. It can help you to know if something is a good idea. In this example, you may say, well, I have my search results. I want to add images based on customer experience research. People like images. Why not add them? And it seems like a great idea. But if you think a little bit more, you will start thinking, well, what if, I add, if adding the images make my website slower? Or what if I am showing less search results in my screen space? Or what if the most relevant result doesn't have an image? Is it really that straightforward to know if it's good or not? Well, it is not, right? And that's why you could use A-B experimentation. And A-B experimentation can help you as well to know if you want to iterate on a good idea, if you want to remove something for your product to say, does it really matter? Or you may have a, a, a hypothesis of a business decision that you can put out there. And for many people, this is magic. But let me tell you, it is not magic. And, this, and because the concept of A-B testing is so simple to understand, and there are so many tools that are so easy to implement in your product, to be honest, like most of the time I see A-B experiments that are, people are using them, they are overusing them, and they're not following the right practices. And, and when that happens, I mean, as, as Maslow, Maslow wisely said, when the only tool that you have is a hammer, you treat everything as if it were a nail. This is when we bring the science. Because doing experimentation is actually doing science. And science has a very rigorous and strict procedure. And if you don't follow it, or if you kind of follow it, you're not doing science. You're only doing pseudoscience. And I don't know about you, but I don't trust pseudoscience, not even like directionally. Like this medicine was directionally positive, right? You want to know if this is good or not. So how do, you, how do you make sure that your experiments are scientifically sound? You use the experimentation method. Yeah, the one that you use back in elementary or middle school. It has six steps. The first one is you observe the world, you formulate a hypothesis, you design an experiment, you run the experiment, you analyze the results, and then you prove or reject your hypothesis. And for product management, it is almost the same. I would just add maybe a step above to say, well, you may be asking a question or you have an objective, and at the end, a way to communicate your results to others in your organization. So let's start for, like, with, with some examples. First, what kind of questions can, can you answer? 
they can go from something as simple as saying, how can I increase my revenue? How can I increase my usage? But it could be uh, something more philosophical, like how can I make my users happier? How can I make my, sure that my product is lovable? And after that, you have to do observation. You have to do some background research. You start researching like what other experiments have been, have been done in the past, um, what has changed since then, and then you start looking into all those different user research methodologies that are giving you very rich qualitative and quantitative data from surveys, focus groups, one-on-ones, um, log analysis, et cetera. And based on all of that, then you develop the hypothesis. And a hypothesis is just a testable explanation of a phenomenon. And it has two very important components. It's testable. It means that you can measure it. And it has an explanation. It means that there's a story that backs, that backs, the, 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 that backs up the phenomenon. And when you have a hypothesis, you actually have an educated guess of what is going to happen. And you need to have it. Because the objective of an experiment is to prove or to disprove a hypothesis. If you don't have a hypothesis, you don't have an experiment. So I will uh, recommend you not just to run experiment just to see what happens or just to collect some data. If you're doing that, you're not doing an experiment. So I will give you an example from my time at Amazon. I cannot talk right now about my experiments at Google. Um, but I run this when I was a PM uh, for the mobile app at Amazon. And here, for example, my question was, how can I increase the sales for prime users on my mobile app? I did some background research. I was able to find that users had troubles finding the filter menu. Um, I found that people were getting overwhelmed with the number of search results. You can see that there are 40,000 results for a search for a shirt. Uh, but I also found that the prime filter what had, a, had a really conversion, high conversion rate. Um, I did some other research that I was able to find that decreasing the number of options uh, helps decision-making process, but I also found some contradictory information that was telling me that past experiments that were reducing the number of search results were, were um, linked to reducing revenue. So one of the ideas was, okay, let's conduct an experiment. So my hypothesis here was that prime users will spend more money if they can easily narrow their search results to prime products. So let's test if this makes sense. Is it testable? Yes, I mean, I can measure the changes in revenue. We had that possibility. Um, does it have an explanation? Yeah, I mean, I have a story that tells me that uh, user will be able to make decisions faster if there are less results or more relevant. And do I have an educated guess? Yes, because I'm not, I'm not just saying that there will be a change in revenue. I'm actually saying that it's going to be increasing because of this reason. So with that in mind, let's go to the next step to design the experiment. In reality, before you even go to this step, there are many other things that at least we had to do. We did usability testing, just to try different designs, just to make sure that people actually understood the UI. Because as I said before, experiments are not going to tell you why. They're only tell you how much or how many. So you, you need to make sure that whatever you're putting out there, you, you remove as many variables as possible. So you don't want to say, well, I don't know if the experiment was good or bad because people didn't understand the feature or people didn't find it. You have to do that before. So in this case, we did a couple of different, use different methodologies. We came up with this specific design of saying, yep, yeah, people understand what that means. We're going to have a toggle at the top of the navigation bar. We're only going to be using it for all US prime customers using the iOS uh, app. We're, ha we're going to have the toggle off by default, no other changes, and try to minimize every other change. So no changes to ranking algorithms, no changes to when the prime filter appears. We'll be using the same logic. And also, if there's other prime filters behind the filter menu, we're not changing anything like that. Um, in terms of the triggering, uh, the triggering criteria, we're, as I say, we're only showing this experiment to US customers using the iOS app, not anyone else. We're only going to be using it when the results, any of the results has a prime product in it, and we're going to be measuring based on a session. Every session will be a new data point. How long? We're going to do it for two weeks. And in this case, I just want to give you with some, um, some best practices. 
In consumer-facing applications, usually you test weekly because user behavior changes dramatically from a Tuesday to a Sunday. So you want to make sure that you encompass all of those changes as in each one of your tests. It's important to know when you are doing those two weeks because you want to avoid any kind of holiday or any other context or situation would cut that could alter the regular behavior of your users. And as well, which of those two weeks? Sometimes you run an experiment and you don't want to take the first two weeks into account because there are things that are called novel novelty effect, that you may have a new feature, that you may get a lot of engagement at the beginning because it's kind of shiny, but then the, the, the effect will, will, will wrap off or will wear off. Or it could be the opposite, that sometimes you put a new feature and people do not know what's going on, so there's a learnability effect that will take a couple of days or weeks or even months to, to, to really understand what will be the impact of your experiment. So be careful about that specific duration. And then you have the launch criteria. And the launch criteria is not just the success metric. You're, I mean, you have to choose your success metric. I'm not going to talk a lot about that because that could take just an hour. Um, but you have to decide like what is going to happen. So in this case, my, my success metric is revenue. And I'm saying that it's going to be increasing. I'm not saying how much, but I'm going to say that it's increasing statistically. And I also have a guardrail there that I don't want to increase latency. Then you run the experiment. Here you see that the only difference is the actual toggle that appears there. The number of results are the same. The results are the same. Everything else is the same. And then you, you run for two weeks and you collect the data. Let's suppose, this is not real, but let's suppose that this is the actual information that we got, that it increased revenue by 2.5% with a p-value of 0 0.05. What does that mean? To be able to analyze the data, I just want to go through four concepts that you have to understand. Number one is statistically significant. And this is the likelihood that the numeric difference between your control and your treatment is, was not due to random sampling or, or a random error. Uh, in general, you want your experiments to be statistically significant. The null hypothesis. The null hypothesis states that the, there's no difference, actually, there's no statistically difference between your control and your treatment. And if there is any difference, it's usually by, by, a, by an error or random chance. So in general, you want to reject the null hypothesis because you are expecting to see a change between these two, right? And the good part is that there's a measurement called p-value that, that will tell you the likelihood that the null hypothesis is valid. So if you want to reject the null hypothesis, you're looking for a very low p-value. And the last one is the confidence interval. And the confidence interval is the range, lower bound and upper bound, where your prediction should lay in. So you're looking, so basically telling you like, what will be the, the, the least amount or the, the highest amount. So looking at our example again, with this, with this result, based on the confidence interval, we can say that this result was significantly positive. The confidence interval, everything is on the positive side. But for example, if it were in the negative side, all of it, it will be statistically uh, negative. So then you can make the assumption that your variable will decrease. There are other... It could happen that your uh, experiment, your confidence interval will have parts in the positive and in the negative, and in that case, it's an inconclusive result. And there's a fourth one that is a little bit tricky, that is also inconclusive, but sometimes it's called flat. And in here, you as a product manager, you may say, I'm going to create this concept that is called practical significance. And practical significance will say, well, I'm going to have a risk level of, in this case, like 0.5%. So I am okay if the confidence interval crosses zero, but it's above my risk factor. So in this case, I'm okay launching this feature as long as I'm not losing more than 0.5% of the revenue. What I want to tell you with this result is that when people talk about do no harm experiments, they don't exist. So if someone tells you, oh, this is a do not harm experiment, that's a lie. That they are inconclusive or they could be flat. And when they are flat, it means that you have a risk level, you have a tolerance to some loss. Um, when people are talking about, oh, this experiment is leaning negative or is leaning positive, that's not true. So if you're using those concepts, 
please stop using them. And if you hear someone else using them, uh, I would encourage them to take some statistics courses. <laughs> the next one is to draw conclusions. So you have the results. So what happened, right? You have to first validate the data. Is the data too good to be true? Like maybe it's not, it's, not, it's not real, right? Or if it's really bad and you were expecting something good, maybe there was like a technical problem. Look into the data and really validate that it's actually correct. Then you have to craft the story. Use all of the research before and all of the new research and compose a story. Does it make sense? What are you learning? And look into other variables as well. What other behaviors changed? What did you learn? Because at the end, these, exper these experiments are about learning, about knowing something different about your, about your product, how your product, how do your customers use your product, and evaluate re your results. Here, you have to be your own devil's advocate. That means that you have to think about like, what are all the good reasons to launch this experiment based on your launch criteria, and all the reasons not to launch it. And then you can start saying, hey, yeah, it makes sense, I, 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 I want one over the other. Think about all of the learnings, all the observations that you can get and write them down. Choose the right metrics. Uh, think about short-term and long-term metrics. Whatever experiment you're doing, you're basically incentivizing users to have a very specific behavior. So be careful about which metrics you're trying to optimize. Use metrics that matter. Many times I've seen people saying, well, we can only measure clicks. But clicks are cheap, I have to say. So make sure that you're, you're measuring whatever it matters. And if you cannot measure it at that moment, don't do an experiment. There are other multiple ways, multiple methodologies that you can use to, to know if something is better or not. And also align on the success metrics for your whole company. You don't want to be conducting an experiment that is in, uh, moving one metric to one side what other part of their company is trying to do the opposite. Uh, it's not great. Be a good one to be scientist. What I mean here is that really use the scientific method and I implore you to actually use it. It's not a suggestion. If you're not doing it, you're just doing pseudoscience. Be suspicious if you see results that do not, uh, that they don't have the result in, that you were expecting. If you were trying to move one metric and then suddenly another metric was great, you're like, well, I will still launch it. Don't do that because you're basically, you don't understand what happened. So think about it, run it again, and see if it actually, uh, if your hypothesis is still valid. Also, the more that you slice your data, uh, the more false positive you say, you, you will get. And as the saying says, if you torture data a lot, it will tell you whatever you want. Um, so, and even if you run like multiple experiments, just by chance, some of, those experiences, some of those experiments may be significantly positive when they are not. And also lean against rolling out any kind of flat experiments. You really want to make sure that your experience is better. So if you are launching an experiment and you actually do, know, do not know if it's good or not, but you're just launching because you just invested time and money, um, you're doing something wrong. Unless, uh, of course, there's maybe there are a lot of changes and you just wanna make sure that, uh, that you're okay with that kind of risk level. And last but not least, follow processes. Some of the examples will be create a process for intake of new ideas, and new ideas come from everywhere, not just from the product team, um, and establish some templates from before you, uh, for you, the, the, the design of your experiment before you launch it, and after you launch it or not launch it, just to document all of your learnings. And, and as I say, you have to document those learnings and share it with everyone in the company so everyone can, can, can benefit from your work. And I will just, end with, the, with a phrase from Carl Sagan that says that somewhere, something incredibly is waiting to be known, so hopefully you will find it. <laughs>